Hi, I'm Doug from Dynamic Computing and welcome to episode 105 of 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. This week we're revisiting an old friend in a new way. If you recall, a couple of months back I did a couple of uh, videos featuring the RGB to HDMI flicker fixer solution that I used both in my Amiga 2000 build and also on my Amiga 500 with a vampire. Take a look right there for a link to those videos. In a nutshell, the RGB to HDMI is a cool device that uses a Pi Zero to take over some of the functions of the Denise chip, which is physically attached to it, deinterlace that and send that out via HDMI on our OCS ECS machines. And it looks beautiful. So we've got the solution for the Amiga 500 and the Amiga 2000. Does that leave our little beautiful Amiga 1000 out in the cold with, with no love whatsoever? Nay, nay. Let's look at what I consider to be the finest solution. Linux Jedi, who sometimes goes by the code name Andrew Hutchings, he's quite involved with the PyStorm community and also the RGB to HDMI community. Uh, take a look at his blog that he does. It's called This Week in PyStorm. You'll see the link right down here. And also I'll have a link in the description. He updates us all the time on the new happenings with the Pi Storm. And take a look right here for my review of the Pi Storm. And pretty soon I'll have an updated review of that with the new code. Make sure you bookmark his blog and you also follow him on Twitter. One of the projects that he's involved with for the RGB to HDMI adapter is this adapter right here for the Amiga 1000. Now the original RGB to HDMI interface could, in theory, work on an Amiga 1000, but the Denise chip does not pass through the same signals. It's missing some important uh, uh, signaling, including a critical C-Sync signal. So if you wanted to use the RGB to HDMI in your Amiga 1000, you got to have a couple of bodge wires going to the Denise chip, and it just got a little bit messy. He wasn't satisfied with that, and so he came up with this beautiful little board right here to solve most of those problems and make it as simple as possible. But before we jump into the review, just wanted to mention that I've uh, taken the Vampire out of my Amiga 1000 and put my classic 520 back in, and I want to show you something cool about that. Now in the past, I had my classic 520 accelerator in a 3D printed case that was designed for an Amiga 500. So everything kind of faced the wrong direction. Our good friends at AmigaStore.eu 3D printed this custom case for me and sent it out to me uh, that mounts right in the side. It's got some little stands there so it, uh, I, I don't have to use my bright orange one or my bright yellow one. Uh, thanks, David Z. Um, and works great. Take a look right there for my video review. Boom, boom of the classic 520 accelerator in the Amiga 1000. Now here we have my lovely board itself. You see I've taken my Denise, which is an R6 version of the Denise chip, the one with extra half bright mode. I think this is either the second or the third generation of Denise chip that the Amiga 1000 came from. And it fits right onto this beautiful board right here. Ignore that line right there. Uh, that was mistakenly printed there. This is the CPLD chip, the chip that needs to be programmed, which we'll go over in just a minute, to allow the proper Amiga 1000 signals to uh, be sent to the Pi Zero, which mounts right on the top right here. Notice here, we have three different connectors for buttons. You can use the single button connector, like this little beauty right here, and everything will work great with it. But you can also add two more buttons to this. So then this button will be kind of your OK button. This will be uh, moving your cursor up. This will be moving your cursor down. It makes it really handy if you're manipulating settings in your RGB to HDMI. It makes it easier than the one button connection. Now here is one of the keys. Right here is a jumper labeled C-Sync. It's a single connector right here. This is going to grab the C-Sync signal from another chip on the Amiga 1000 board. And let me show you right where that chip is. Right here, 
we have this chip called U6A. The eighth pin over right there is the C-Sync signal, okay? You grab one of these little clips that just clips right onto the end. See the little red clip there? And connect it right up to C-Sync on the board, and it passes that C-Sync signal right through, and then the logic of this chip here sends it correctly to the RGB to HDMI board. Doesn't get any easier than that. So now that we have the physical hardware installed, it's time to get to the software ends of things. And it's actually pretty darn easy. You need a micro SD card of any size. And when I say any size, literally, you could use a, you know, a 256 megabyte or a 32 megabyte uh, micro SD card if you wanted to. This software doesn't take up much space at all. Download the appropriate software from the link in the description. I'll also uh, put a link right there for it. Um, and this latest version that I used was from May 29th, 2021. This is a zip file. You can see it right there containing everything we need. Okay, you're going to decompress this zip file on your PC and then copy the entire folder, everything in that folder right to the root of your SD card. Now we need to copy a few little profiles over. If you look here, you'll see where the, uh, the, the profiles are located in the directory. And I'll also have that in the description and it's right on the GitHub too. In a nutshell, you copy the file containing the code for the CPLD chip to the root of the SD card. And then you copy the default.txt from the folder that's listed there into the profiles directory of the card. Those are the only two things that you have to change. If you want to use a three button solution instead of a one button solution, what you'll want to do is open that default.txt file that we just moved. Just open it in your Windows machine and scrolling down, you'll find a heading that says one button. Okay, change that from one it says equals one, change it to equals zero, boom, it enables all three buttons on your device and you can use a three button solution for it. Now you'll take your SD card that we just moved the files on and you'll plug that into the Pi Zero and you take a uh, the mini HDMI connector, uh, plug it into the Pi Zero, plug the HDMI into your favorite HDMI enabled monitor, power on the Amiga. Let's take a look at what happens next. You're going to be presented with a screen that looks similar to this that says update CPLD menu. You're going to use your, your single button to cursor down to 6-12 bit RGB CPLD underscore V92. Maybe they're up to a new version by now. We don't know. And you're going to press the button and hold it on that and it updates the CPLD chip in your adapter with the code to run properly on the Amiga 1000. Once that's done, it reboots the Pi Zero and you'll probably be presented with a screen that is maybe just a little bit distorted. Now mine in this case has already been programmed so it looks fine, but you may find some shimmering in some pixels, maybe some text is, is off a little bit and that's because your device has not yet been calibrated. So you're going to Hold the button on your Pi Zero interface, bring up the main menu, press the button until you go down to Auto Calibrate Video Sampling. Make sure there's a nice still screen, like a workbench screen or something like that with nothing moving. You hold the button down there, press again to confirm calibration. Video must be static. And you'll see what it does is it goes through and it tests various samplings and settings and tries to correct them and come up with the absolute best display that it can. This whole thing takes about 30 seconds or so. And now that it's finished, we can just go ahead and scroll down to save configuration here. Whoops, went past it. This is where a three button uh, solution is a little easier because you can use one button to go up and one button to go down. Save configuration, yippee skippy. Now we go to return 
and we should have a rock solid workbench display. Absolutely rock solid. This is an actual interlaced display right here. You can see it's just perfect. Now, the colors and the display of the Amiga 1000 are some of the best that I've ever seen on any Amiga. Even when you're just running through composite, it actually looks really, really good. Better than most Amigas do. Let's take a look at a couple of screens here and see what we have. Let's open up personal paint and see how that looks in high resolution. Here's a nice high resolution 640 by uh, 400 mode. And you can see it's nice and fast, tack sharp, and not a, even a hint of flicker anywhere on the screen. Let's take a look at DigiPaint 3. This is a program we're gonna be spending a lot of time with over the next couple of weeks. And we'll open up an image here. High resolution, ham six image. Look how perfectly tack sharp that is with no sign of any flicker at all. Absolutely perfect. Let's take a look at TV Text Pro. We're gonna to go to high resolution, interlace, 16 color uh, with overscan. And we'll open up a nice image here. Load screen as is. Pix TV Text Pro. Again, high resolution. Normally this would be an interlace screen. This thing is rock solid. And what about video games, you may ask? Well, let's take a look at Shadow of the Beast 2. Again, running on an Amiga 1000. There's our beautiful Cygnosis logo. An Amiga game by Reflections. Not too shabby so far. Moon. You can see it works absolutely perfectly. And I'm absolutely terrible at this game. So We've seen that it absolutely does its flicker fixturing absolutely perfectly. Games look great. I don't see any lag on any of that, except the lag that I introduce by being, you know, basically bad at video games. So my opinion, well, this thing is just about perfect, really. You do have to copy over some files to an SD card, but it's not difficult. And unlike the Pi Storm, you don't have to do anything in Linux and um, you don't have to do a lot of reconfiguring of files and moving things around. It's a couple, you know, three, four fairly easy steps on a Windows or a Mac PC. I had mine up and running from the time I unboxed it till I got an image on the screen in about 10 minutes. Now, these are actually 10 minutes made up of, you know, in 60 second increments. These are not 10 minute Amiga retrocast 10 minute spans of time. Physical installation is pretty easy. Just make sure when you're pulling out your Denise chip, you're very careful. You can use a screwdriver if you want to, but it's better to use something that's non-conductive and will tend to, you know, maybe scratch the board a little bit less. You just put the chip in nice and easily, slot the board into the Denise slot nice and gently, and just be careful and you'll be just fine. The fact that we just have one signal to grab from the board itself and you use just a little clip and it's like, ping, right on the, the, the chip and plug it right in, 
it's easy. It, there, there's very little that can go wrong as long as you read the instructions three times and make sure you're doing it correctly. So where can you get this adapter from? Well, every now and again, Linux Jedi will sell them. Uh, that's how I got mine. He happened to have a batch of five or ten of them for sale. But the cool thing is, is they're absolutely no charge to make yourself, except of course the cost of buying the parts. He's got all of the Gerbers for it already sent up to PCB Way. There's a link on his GitHub page where you can go to PCB Way, order the darn board yourself for a couple of bucks, have it shipped to you. He's got a bill of material for which chips you need. Most of them are pretty commonly available. You can build it yourself if you want to. He also doesn't have any issue if other people want to make the board and sell it. He has a couple of requests on the GitHub page if you're going to do that. You like make sure you get in touch with them so you can spread the word with who's selling them. But Talk to your favorite vendor if you want someone to sell them for you. Get in touch with your favorite vendor. Maybe they'll make a batch of 10 or 20 of them and, and resell them. This is so much better than the RGB to SCART to HDMI solution that I often use on my Amiga 1000. And that's not a bad solution. It, it's fine. It's, you know, middle of the road. But this, rock solid. This is as good as any flicker fixer I've ever seen on any Amiga, absolutely 100% as high quality. How much are you gonna spend on it? Eh. Figure on a, a board that's assembled, if you buy all the parts or if you buy it assembled, $25, $35, right in that range. Pi Zero, $20, $25, uh, it, you can find them online for. Uh, figure a couple of bucks for the wires and a couple of bucks for a nice tiny micro SD card. So, you know, maybe just north of $50 you've got yourself an absolutely beautiful flicker fixture for your Amiga 1000. Huge thanks to my absolutely wonderful patrons. You see them right here, and you know that they're just awesome. I mean, they're here on this list. They're awesome. Um, if you'd like to help out the show, pop on over to patreon.com forward slash 10 mark. Two bucks a month, you can make it on this list. And my goal is over the next couple of weeks to use TV Text Professional, which I just showed you here, along with my Amiga 1000 Genlock, which I haven't spent a lot of time with on the channel, and create the patron list right on there for display. I thought that'd be kind of cool. So I'm going to be working on that project. Thanks for joining me today on this actually short video. I really appreciate it. Please like and subscribe. Please leave comments below. Every little bit helps. Be sure to follow me on the socials. All the links are in the description. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, signing out.